borrowers offers all types of policies, including basic yield policies that provide coverage based on harvested yield per acre and revenue policies with both upside and downside price protection. Cost depends on the crop, policy, and your location. That's why our crop insurance agents help you price out the best options and coverage level for your business. Crop Growers through Farm Credit is here to help you weather your financial ups and downs, no matter what crops up. Learn more at CropGrowers.com. So welcome everybody. We will go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining our fourth and final session of the North Country Regional Ag Team's Dairy Day. My name is Casey Havikus. I am one of the dairy management specialists on the North Country Regional Ag Team. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Lindsay Ferlito, who is going to help me moderate. So between, or for the remainder of the day, you're going to be hearing from both Lindsay and I and if you have any uh, questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and Lindsay will be sure to help you with those. We will kick it off with our first speaker, Dr. Jennifer Vanoss. Dr. Vanoss is an assistant professor and extension specialist in animal welfare on the faculty of the Department of Animal and Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Jennifer, I will pass it over to you and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. So are you seeing my presentation in full screen? Yep, looks good. Excellent. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I'm very excited to talk about calves and to share my uh, perspective as an animal welfare specialist. So today I'll be talking about housing and management considerations for dairy calf behavior and welfare. And I will give you a spoiler that this presentation will be heavily focused on parent group housing. It's a topic where we've been getting an increasing amount of interest and questions. So I hope that we'll have some good discussions today. So just to give an overview, I want to introduce the term animal welfare because I think it sometimes causes a little bit of confusion. A lot of times in the dairy industry, we speak in terms of animal care, which is definitely relevant. And so to me, animal care refers to all the things that we in the industry do, and these are the inputs into the system. So when we talk about housing, management, or animal handling, those are aspects of animal care that then lead to animal welfare, and that's what the animal experience is. So animal welfare or animal well-being is the outcome and that's the animal's state. So a cow or a calf can be in a state of good welfare or she can be in a state of poor welfare or somewhere in between on that spectrum. So that's what I want people to keep in mind when I use that term. In terms of how we define animal welfare from a scientific perspective and think about what actually contributes to those outcomes, there are a number of different definitions and frameworks. So the one I'm presenting today comes from Dr. David Fraser from UBC, where I think a few of the organizers and myself have an academic lineage with him. But he introduced this idea that there are a lot of different perspectives when we're talking about animal welfare. So first of all, of course, we're concerned with the animal's biological or phys physiological functioning. So what is their state of bodily health? Are they productive? Are they thriving? And so that is very, central, of course, but when we talk about animal welfare or animal well-being, it's not only about health, but also about these other aspects. So one of the key things to remember is that it all comes down to what the animal is experiencing subjectively. So we could call this their feelings or their emotional state, and this reflects whether they're experiencing something positive, negative, 
or something in between. And I think this is really critical to the concept of animal welfare, because this is why we don't study plant welfare, even though plants have biological functioning and we can study plant productivity, plant pathology, we're not concerned whether or not they're suffering. So we're not trying to project our human experiences onto species such as cattle, but we acknowledge that enough scientific research has been done to validate that they can have negative experiences we want to minimize, like pain or fear, and they can also, on the flip side, have positive experiences. So there are things they find rewarding, there's ways to promote comfort and contentment, and so that's really critical. So one of the things that can affect how an animal experiences life is not only her health status, but also her ability to perform important behaviors. So when we talk about behaviors that are important to calves, this will be different than behaviors that are important to say dogs. So it's really important to understand that species and their life stage to know what's appropriate and what's important to them. So sometimes I call this their behavioral well-being as opposed to their physical well-being. So I just wanted to put that context out there first. Some of the information I'll be sharing today is from a survey that we conducted a little over a year ago at the end of 2019. And so we sent out this survey and we're very pleased to get over 400 responses nationwide. So many of our respondents were of course in Wisconsin where I'm located, but we did get responses from 30 out of 50 states in the US. And what I have there for your reference on the right is the heat map of dairy farms in the United States, according to the NASS survey. And so what you can see is that we actually captured um, quite a few states that have a large dairy presence, including in the New York region. And just for your reference, on average, farms that identified themselves as dairies had approximately 190 pre-weaned heifer calves on the day they answered. And for those that identified as calf ranches, they had 4,500. Um, calves, but there were fewer of those types of farms. So one of the questions that we asked in the survey was, how do you house your pre-weaned calves? And what we found was that 77% of the farms in our survey used individual housing. And this lines up with what the USDA had previously reported a few years earlier, although they gathered data from actually a smaller subset of states in the US. So they found that 75% of farms house their calves individually. Within our sample, we found that individual housing was the single most common system outdoors, and that was followed then by individual housing indoors. So you can see 42 and 25% there of our sample. Some farms used a combination of indoor and outdoor housing, but they kept their calves individually. And then you can see in those two darkest shaded portions of the pie that the remaining farms use some kind of what I'm calling social housing. So social housing means there were at least two calves housed together. Um, and on some of these farms, they used a combination. So some of their calves were housed individually all the way through weaning. Some were housed in pairs or groups, but we categorized all of those as farms that use some kind of pair or group housing. So throughout this talk, when I show the survey results, that's what I mean by social housing. So out of the farms using social housing, nearly two thirds kept calves in smaller groups of two to eight, and then the rest of them used larger groups of more than eight calves. So clearly individual housing is the norm in our industry and has been for quite a while. And this is for several reasons. So in part, this was spurred based on concerns a few decades ago about calf morbidity and mortality. And social isolation was seen as a important strategy for reducing the risk of disease. So part of this is because when you house calves individually, you can control and monitor the individual calves feeding, and you can also monitor easily for health issues. Also, when you physically separate calves with solid barriers, you can potentially reduce disease risk by limiting direct calf to calf contact, as well as their shared aerosol and contamination of anything that's shared, such as bedding or feeding equipment. And an additional benefit is that it can be easier to handle individual calves for management practices such as vaccination or disbudding. One thing to note is that with individual housing separated by wire panels, um, you, you actually are not gaining those advantages of that second chunk there with reducing the calf to calf contact. 
I think it has been a very hot topic recently to talk about this idea of individual versus social housing, especially in the context of what we're experiencing as humans with this pandemic, where we've been talking a lot about social distancing or physical distancing. And it is important to acknowledge that newborn calves are in fact a high risk group for disease because they have immature immune systems. And we'll return to this towards the end of the talk about promoting good health. But it's also extremely important to recognize that dairy cattle are a social species. So this comes back to understanding their behavioral needs. They are herd animals and we've known this for a long time. And this means that having some kind of companionship is very important for calves because this is part of their behavioral well-being. And so this is why today I'll be talking mainly about pair or group housing because this is important when we're thinking about behavior and welfare for calves. If I had to bet, I would say looking into my theoretical crystal ball, it's very likely that the norm for raising calves will shift in the coming decades away from individual housing toward pair or group housing. This won't happen overnight, but it is becoming increasingly common and there has been a lot of interest in our industry. So here's an example from overseas where a couple of years ago, a major grocery retail chain in the UK announced a new policy for their supplier farms. So this was from Tesco and the headline in this news announcement says that there's a single calf hutch ban. And that's a little bit misleading because it wasn't about hutches as a housing type, but rather individual housing. And I think it is likely that we'll see pressure from within the supply chain to enhance calf welfare by providing social contact. So on the side of this particular news article, there's a small headline that says, research shows benefits of pair housing calves pre-weaning. And so that's what I want to go over briefly next is what is this research that supports the practice of pair group housing? So I've categorized the benefits into a few different upsides that can happen when you pair calves. So the first is that we see in the calves gain the ability to play with others, both literally and figuratively. So literally, when you have social contact combined with a greater total space allowance from group housing, we see an increase in play behavior. And this, again, is a reflection of this behavioral well-being concept. We also see that calves learn to play with others figuratively, meaning it helps with their social development. So when calves are paired at a young age, what we see is that they learn how to communicate appropriately with others of their kind. And as they mature, we see that they have greater social success. So they gain a higher rank in their social dominance hierarchy, meaning they have better competitive ability and better access to resources, yet at the same time, they're less aggressive. So it's that they behave more appropriately with others of their species. In addition to these benefits, there's also benefits to other aspects of their development. And so there are several studies showing that calves housed in pairs or groups from a young age have better cognitive abilities or learning abilities, and they show greater behavioral flexibility. So I'll explain why this is important in a minute, but essentially it means that they're more adaptable to new situations or new things they're exposed to. And that includes new food items. So they approach them sooner and they eat more. And this then translates into better resilience to stress in the face of new or stressful situations, especially around the time of weaning. So in terms of cognitive ability, this can sound a little bit esoteric, but it actually matters if we think about what we expect from our calves as they grow into milking cows over their lifetime. So if we think about what they go through, they encounter a lot of new experiences. And their early development affects how well they cope with those changes and they encounter a lot of these. So if we think about a calf as she matures, she will be experiencing new diets and new types of food and she will be fed these in different types of receptacles. So initially she may get water out of a bucket and then she'll need to learn to use a drinker and then a trough and so on and so forth with their food items as well. She'll also experience new social groups. So she'll be moved to new pens, she'll be regrouped and then have to be able to figure out how to interact appropriately with other cattle. So we talked about that a moment ago. Also the housing environment can change. So a calf may originally be housed in a hutch and then move to a bedded pack after weaning and then be expected to adapt to free stalls when she becomes a milking cow. 
And again, in these environments, there's a lot of changes. So where is she supposed to lie down? How is she supposed to drink? How is she supposed to eat? And then of course, most importantly, she grows up and has to do her job. And I think some people may have experienced if they have a double parlor that perhaps they have a cow who goes perfectly into the parlor on one side, but then she is regrouped or expected to go into the other side and she balks. And so this is an example of why the ability to learn quickly and adapt to new situations is important. And likewise, as more farms adopt milking robots or automatic milking systems, they might encounter difficulties if heifers have difficulty learning. So this idea of learning ability, it isn't about making cows too smart. It's about making sure they can meet our expectations for what they have to go through in their lifetimes as dairy cows. There's also an additional set of benefits that isn't about animal welfare per se, but it's a win-win for the dairy operation where calves show better growth performance and solid feed intake when they're pair or group housed, especially early on in their development. And this is not just a one-off pattern. So here I'm summarizing um, some information taken from a literature review by Dr. Joao Costa a few years ago with some more recent studies added as well. So what this is showing is the number of studies that have observed either positives for pair or group housing of calves from a young age, or no difference compared to individual housing or negatives. So the green plus signs indicate the number of studies that detected advantages for pair or small group housing for either dry matter intake of starter grain, average daily gain through the pre-weaning period or the weaning body weight. And then the gray arrows represent the number of studies that found no difference. So the calves that were raised individually versus then pairs or small groups performed equally. And then the red minus signs would represent a disadvantage to pair group housing. But what should stand out to you there is that no study to date has ever found a disadvantage to solid feed intake or growth. So instead, some studies don't detect any difference and many studies detect an advantage. Part of the puzzle here is the amount of uh, milk allowance. And so in the pattern seems to suggest that when you feed greater milk or milk replacer allowances, that this allows the benefits of social housing to become apparent. And we know that this is important because growth early on in life is predictive of future productivity, especially in the first lactation. And so we want to set our calves up for success from a young age. Lastly, there's some new evidence suggesting that there's an additional benefit of pair or small group housing. And this has to do with public acceptance of dairy farming practices. So when we talk about um, animal welfare, it's something that isn't just interesting from a scientific perspective or, or relevant to the dairy farm in terms of how we raise our animals. It's something where there's wider public interest. And it's becoming increasingly critical for a concept called social license. And what this refers to is the idea that if we are going to continue to producing to produce food for future generations, then not only do the products themselves have to be palatable to consumers, but also the practices with which they're produced. So we know that consumers have choices when they go to grocery stores or restaurants, and that means that they could potentially choose not to consume dairy products. So to maintain consumer confidence and make sure that these consumers feel good about what they're purchasing, we have to keep in mind this idea that social license includes how we treat our animals. So there was a study recently done by the University of Minnesota, and what they did was they went to the Minnesota State Fair, and they stood outside the entrance with iPads and asked people if they'd be willing to participate in a short survey. And they actually got 1,300 people to agree to participate. And one thing to keep in mind is that nearly all of these people were consumers of dairy products. So they were our potential customer base. They're not anti-ag people. And so what they wanted to find out was what do these potential consumers think about calf raising practices? So they showed them three different photos in a randomized order of Holstein calves housed indoors in a calf barn to try to standardize the environments. And the calves were either in an individual pen, a paired pen, or a small group pen. So the bar graph here is showing the proportion of participants um, who felt a certain way about individual housing based on what they saw in the picture. And the striking thing was that only a third of participants felt that individual housing was something that they thought was an acceptable way to raise dairy calves. 
about a fifth of people had no opinion, they were fairly neutral, but then half of people thought that individual housing was unacceptable. So that's very alarming news. In contrast, when these same participants were shown pictures of pair house calves or calves housed in small groups, then we found that two thirds of people thought that pair housing was acceptable. Three quarters of people thought that small group housing was acceptable. Um, a, about a fifth or fewer people were neutral, and then only a very small percentage of people thought that these methods were unacceptable. So this is just one study looking at the consumer perspective, but it shows that looking at the way we raise calves may be an important aspect of ensuring continued consumer acceptance for dairy production. So there are a variety of potential benefits for pair group raising, but that doesn't mean that it's without challenges. So I want to talk through a couple of key questions that tend to come up. So the first is that some producers have the perception that they don't have the right housing facilities to switch over from individual housing to pairs or groups. Um, and so this is a practical limitation. So one of the things we wanted to illustrate with our survey responses was that there isn't one single right way to pair group house calves. So there, there can be a variety of options to do so successfully. So many producers do prefer to house their calves indoors in a barn for both the comfort of the animals themselves and the people who care for them, particularly in inclement weather. And lots of times when we talk about group housing, people automatically picture large group pens with automatic milk feeders. And in fact, we found that a little bit under a third of farms in our sample who use social housing do in fact use this housing type, but it's certainly not the only type. So there are a few advantages for um, large group systems with automatic milk feeding. So potentially it can save labor relative to manual feeding. And that includes um, labor related to adding bedding. So producers have reported that they find that it's easier to deal with one large pen rather than individual ones. But this certainly isn't the only way. So even within a barn, there are other ways to manage calves. And so actually we found that the most common social housing type was indoor barn housing, but with manual feeding. So about half of those who do manual feeding in our sample used mob feeding. So there's just an example there on the lower right where a group of calves shares a single source for milk or replacer. And then another half of the farms did manual feeding where calves had individual milk or replacer sources. So this was either their own buckets, bottles, or nipple buckets. And so some of these producers, if they use mob feeding, also describe labor savings relative to individual feeding. And lastly, there are also options for producers to do social housing outdoors. So a little over a quarter of the farms in our sample do pair or group house calves, and they either connected individual hutches together with a shared fence, such as the photo on the top, or they purchased or built super hutches that were intended for group housing of calves, such as that shown on the bottom. So I did wanna just highlight this idea of paired hutches. Um, I don't think it's the ideal way to house calves in pairs, but I think it is a very feasible way where producers who already use hutches don't have to invest in a lot of infrastructure to adapt to pair housing. So there's been a few studies exploring this method and it seems like it is gaining in popularity, including in our region here in Wisconsin. But what I'm showing here is a picture from Texas. So one of my graduate students is from Texas and she stopped by this calf ranch last year and they're doing this at scale. So they have over 600 heifer calves on milk at a given time. And they've been doing this for a couple of years now. And the manager reported that initially when they decided to switch over, there was a lot of skepticism among the calf staff and they were worried about potential challenges that would arise with pair housing. But what they found was that there was a yet untapped benefit to pair housing where now the staff could see the calves playing together. They felt more connected to the animals they were working with and seeing the calves playing brought them more joy in their jobs. And because of this, they actually expanded the outdoor area, which they call the playground on their farm so that they could see the calves playing more. So I thought that, that was just a nice illustration of sort of unresearched previous benefits of pair housing. But again, this is not the only way. There's many ways to pair house. So I wanted to just ask a quick poll question, which is regardless of whether you're a producer or not, in general, if you're thinking about pair group housing of calves, how much uh, do you or would you worry about cross-sucking? So the options include, you wouldn't be at all concerned with cross-sucking, not very concerned, somewhat concerned, or extremely concerned.
Okay, great. So thank you for the responses. It looks like the most popular answer is that people would be somewhat concerned about cross-sucking, although there are a few people who are more concerned than that and some that are not very concerned or not at all concerned. All right, thanks. So this is one of the most common questions that I get and in terms of unwanted behavior. So when we're thinking about animal welfare, we want to promote appropriate behaviors in our cattle, but sometimes we see abnormal or undesirable behavior. So in our survey, we found that 85% of producers who do use pair group housing reported at least occasional cross-sucking. So we just asked them subjectively. Um, and only 11% reported frequent cross-sucking. One thing that's interesting to note, though, is we also had farms who use individual housing, but the pens are separated with wire panels. And actually, 70% of those farms observed at least occasional cross-sucking, and 7% observed frequent cross-sucking. So it's actually not a problem that's unique to full social contact. And there are a lot of reasons people have expressed concerns. So people often say they worry that these heifers will mature with blind quarters or that they could get navel infections or frostbite. And unfortunately, there has not actually been a lot of research documenting these long-term effects. But two, two fairly recent studies reported that cross-sucking before weaning is actually not consistently associated with navel infections. And then cross-sucking persisting after weaning is also not consistently associated with either mastitis or higher somatic cell count in the first lactation. But nonetheless, this is an abnormal behavior. It's something that people feel very concerned about and we need strategies to minimize this behavior. The good news is that there actually is a lot of research on strategies to reduce cross-sucking, especially before and during weaning. So one of the keys is to feed a sufficient milk or milk replacer allowance. And there isn't a magic number, but we're talking um, at least eight to 10 quarts per day or more at the peak of milk feeding. The second key, because cross-sucking is related to hunger, is to use some kind of gradual or step-down weaning process instead of removing access to milk cold turkey. So ideally this would be based on an individual calf starter intake, recognizing that monitoring that can be challenging in a group setting. So one of the questions we asked in our survey was how much are people feeding to their pre wean calves? And we specifically asked them to think about when their calves were four weeks old. And the good news is we found that among farms currently using individual housing, half of them actually already feed eight quarts or more. And then among those farms using pair group housing, two thirds feed at least that amount. And in fact, a third of farms with social housing feed 10 quarts or more per day. So this is really good news. A lot of people are already following this recommendation, meaning if they were to either keep using pair housing or transition to it, that is one really key piece of the puzzle for setting them up for success to reduce cross-sucking, as well as to support good calf health and growth performance. There are other strategies as well. So it's not just about hunger, it's also about how the milk is fed. So there's this common misconception that you need to bucket break calves because if you don't, then you're encouraging them to suck. And this is a misunderstanding of the calves natural behavior. So suckling is something innate, it's not learned. And the key is to redirect it appropriately. So feeding milk through some kind of nipple instead of an open bucket allows them to express that natural suckling behavior appropriately. And they need to spend a certain amount of time suckling. And so this includes after they're drinking. So one strategy is to use nipples that are marketed as slower flow. So that extends the length of the milk meal. And then whether or not the nipple is slow flow, it needs to remain available even after the calves have finished drinking their milk to allow them to finish that suckling motivation. But because bottles need to be cleaned after feeding, it's important that your management protocols allow calves enough time, otherwise they still will resort to cross sucking. So in our survey, we did ask how people were feeding their milk or replacer. And we found that farms using pair group housing, which is the bar on the right, 80% of those fed milk through some kind of nipple, whether that's a bottle or a tea bucket or a mob feeder, and only 20% used a bucket or an open trough. But that pattern was completely reversed for the farms using individual housing. So for those farms, if they're thinking about transitioning to group housing, they mean, may need to change their milk feeding strategies. So um, if feeding milk through a nipple isn't feasible, an alternative is to basically provide a pacifier. So a number of studies have shown that just providing an empty nipple, which can remain in the pen and doesn't need to be removed after every feeding can be an alternative strategy that also reduces cross-sucking. 
And what we did in a recent study was we provided calves with Braden bottles, which are specialized bottles for starter grain that allow solids to pass through the nipple. And we found that these served a similar function of um, serving as a pacifier, but also calves were consuming measurable amounts of starter through those. So those are just a couple of options. Um, Casey, I do want to ask you in the interest of time, uh, how many minutes I have left? Uh, you're, you're good if you could wrap up maybe by 1240. Okay, thank you. So I do have a second poll question here, which is if you are thinking about pair housing or currently do that, how much would you or do you worry about calf health outcomes in this context? So again, the options are not at all concerned, not very concerned, somewhat concerned or extremely concerned. Okay, great. So thank you again for participating. And the patterns are very similar as to the poll question about cross-sucking. So most people say they would be somewhat concerned, a handful would be extremely concerned, and um, several are not very concerned, not at all concerned. And of course, this is an imperfect question because we're not comparing how you would respond to health concerns and in individual housing, but thank you. So this is also a question that tends to come up. So what do we know about calf health in pair group housing, given that the drive for individual housing in the first place was because of concerns around calf health? And unfortunately, we need a lot more research because the impact of pair or group housing on calf health is much less clear. So I went over a lot of benefits earlier of pair group housing, but in terms of calf health, it's mixed. So it really depends a lot on management. So what I've done here is I've created a similar table to the one I've shown about solid feed intake and growth before weaning. And so this is adapted from a recent review that Dr. Terry Olivet wrote. And keep in mind, this is only about respiratory health and doesn't reflect diarrhea. And the pattern here is very mixed. So no studies have shown calves have better respiratory health when housed in pairs or groups. Some have found that there's no difference depending on the outcome, and some have found worse outcomes for calf respiratory health in pair group housing compared to an individual housing. And you can see there haven't been that many studies that we can analyze. And, and so it's very mixed. Within group housing, we know that group size is a risk factor where larger groups are more challenging to manage. One thing to note is that, again, this is not about diarrhea. So there have been a couple of studies that actually found less diarrhea in group housing than in individual housing. But again, the story is quite mixed. So what it is important to remember is that there are several factors that contribute to successful calf health outcomes. So we're not gonna go into any detail, but it is important to keep in mind that there are some foundational principles for maintaining good calf health, which is the key component of welfare. And a lot of these apply whether you're raising calves individually or in pairs or groups. So it starts from actually before here, it starts with the maternity area. And then that also includes your colostrum protocol, your nutrition during the milk feeding phase, hygiene practices, including sanitation, biosecurity and biocontainment, space allowance, bedding management, ventilation if you're housing calves indoors, and then how are you managing group moves? So within the pen and within the barn, are you able to use an all-in, all-out strategy? And last but not least, preventative care and monitoring protocols. So I won't be able to go into any detail, but it is really important to keep in mind that housing and group size is not the only factor that affects calf health, and it's really important to stay on top of all of these other important factors. So many farms we have found do successfully raise healthy calves in pairs or groups. So in our survey, 72% of the producers who currently pair group house calves said that they were satisfied with calf health. Of course, this is subjective. We weren't asking them about uh, outcomes that they measure any specific benchmarks, but this was not much worse than farms who house their calves individually. So think about 90% of those farms so that they were satisfied. But again, this doesn't mean that it's not without challenges and individual housing can be more forgiving in some cases if the rest of the management protocols aren't in tip top shape. And it can be more difficult to notice calves in a group setting depending on the management and they might already be sicker and less responsive to treatment by the time they're detected. So it's really important when you're thinking about transitioning to pair group housing 
to review your management practices and make sure all your ducks are in a row. So some farms may need to keep in mind that they might need to make changes to succeed with pair group housing if that's the path that they decide to choose. But I also do want to emphasize that all of the bottlenecks that we've just mentioned have well-established strategies for success. They should be manageable and you shouldn't be dissuaded from considering social housing, even though it may require some work. So given the research to date on pair group housing, as well as the field experience of myself and my colleagues, what we've developed over the past few months is a starter guide for pair group housing. So this is intended to help farms plan ahead if they're thinking about moving to pair group raising, or even if they already are, to allow them to troubleshoot issues on their farm. So this is available on my website. The link is on the bottom. And so it's a starter guide that has seven articles and five of the seven are already published and the last two should be published hopefully next week. And so if you go to that link, you'll be able to see um, these are downloadable as PDFs. And the idea is that if you print them out, the headings are there on the right side and will allow you to flip to the appropriate section. But we have an introduction that goes over the potential benefits of pair group raising, which is what I covered in this talk. And we also talk about ideal benchmarks for cap health before considering transitioning to pairs or groups. We review principles for hygiene practices, grouping strategies, housing options, and then feeding strategies and ways to reduce cross-sucking, which we also covered briefly. And lastly, just some reminders about disbudding and dehorning given the new expectations of the farm program that rolled out about a year ago. So I'd like to just conclude by asking a final question, which is um, whether you're a producer or somebody who works in the industry, what is your current feeling about pair or group housing? How likely would you be to adopt this practice in the future or to recommend it to people you're working with? So it could be that you currently house calves in pairs or groups or promote this practice and plan to continue to do so. You've done so in the past, but you don't plan to do so anymore. Um, you don't currently do this or recommend it, but you might in the future. Or lastly, you don't currently do so and do not continue to do so in the future either. And of course, this is anonymous, so you won't hurt my feelings. I know that uh, this is a bit of a leading question, but it looks like most people either don't do so now, but will consider it in the future or do currently do so and plan to do so in the future as well. Okay, thank you. So. Um, that's all that I have for you today. Again, the link is above. I welcome you to check out my website. Both of these web addresses send you to the exact same place. And I look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was great. Um, so while Rob gets ready, um, if you could please stop screen. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Rob Lynch. Dr. Lynch is a dairy herd health and management specialist with Cornell Pro Dairy Program. So I will turn it over to you, Rob, if you want to start sharing and get started. All right. Thanks, Casey. Now I just have to find my presentation again. All right. Looks good, Rob. Displaying the correct screen. <laughs> yep, you're good. All right. Um, yeah. So I first wanted to just uh, thank the North Country uh, Dairy Regional Specialists for uh, inviting me to participate in today's program and really enjoyed Jennifer's presentation uh, to kick things off. And hopefully um, the stuff I go over will dovetail nicely into, into what she's presented. I see some uh, friends out there. So um, say hello to everybody who's joined on. Looks like a really good turnout. Um, I got a, it's a short period of time, so we can't really cover all things calf health. And so I just sort of picked some of my favorite topics and I'm a, a real big fan of, um, building processes that identify risks for things that could lead to health problems downstream and you know, put in processes to head those off ahead of time. So we don't have to deal with the the expense of what happens later on if things get out of control and animals start getting sick and we start having more uh, mortalities. And so um, let's put systems in place to head off those problems in advance. And next slide. So quickly, just, you know, this is a, it does get into economics. And so I thought I'd share a couple of bits of information to kind of put these 
health issues in perspective. Um, this was um, a financial analysis done several years ago uh, by Zoetis and Agstar that looked at dairy financials for a, a bunch of dairies out in um, the upper Midwest. And um, they tried to identify, you know, what were the key management practices or key measures that had the largest influence on profitability on the farm or in this instance, net farm income. And um, there's a bunch of them there, obviously milk production and, and labor costs and, and reproductive, reproductive efficiencies. Uh, but you know, two of those that um, rose to the top were how well farms managed their overall replacement costs and what kind of heifer survival rates they were able to, to maintain. So these two measures of their replacement program really had a big influence on their, their profitability. Um, trying to include some you know, current information where I can. Um, there's not a lot of changes in the things we do uh, for um, managing calf health, but um, this was uh, some financial analysis that um, Jason Karstis uh, completed here just in 2020, um, looking at um, heifer raising costs um, for the farms uh, participating in his um, in his cost analysis. So this is, this is not to say this is average for the industry or even average for New York, but for the farms that contributed the, the financial data on their heifer raising programs, uh, the 2020 uh, analysis came up with an average of about $2,355 or $3.45 a day. And maybe what's more interesting here is that is the spread. Um, if you just look within the 80th percentile range, the bottom 20% versus the top 20%, there's just about a $500 variance there. Um, so you can see, you know, from farm to farm, there's still a lot of um, opportunity to, to make improvements and, and manage their ever raising expenses. And not to do things as cheap as possible. That's not the goal here. The idea is, you know, how do we end up with the most profitable adult animals when we're, when we're done raising our replacement animals? And I think it's fair to say that health issues negatively, infect, uh, negatively affect calf performance. And that, that in a nutshell is just building inefficiencies into the calf raising program and adding to your costs. So if we think of this from a process standpoint, um, just using colostrum as an example, you know, if we've got some issues that um, lead to uh, poor colostrum management, that leads to more um, failure of passive transfer in those calves, which then leads to more calf disease, like maybe pneumonia, and then downstream, those heifers were more expensive to raise, um, less often making it into the milking herd, and calves that did make it to the milking herd didn't ever really meet their genetic potential, and, and that's just basically replacement program inefficiencies that lead to um, extra costs and, and eroding profitability. So I wanted to introduce the concept, and this is not a new concept to the dairy industry, but using HACCP as an approach to head off issues before they become larger issues. And so HACCP, um, it's a hazard analysis and critical control point uh, strategy where it's a, you just create a systematic approach to the things that we do to get, get, our, get our jobs completed. And this is a, a an approach that's uh, very commonly used in um, the food industry to improve product safety. We can do it on dairies um, as a way of um, identifying limitations in management practices and finding, finding those, those areas where we can monitor the process and get alerted to a, a potential problem before we have those, those crashes downstream. So we're gonna check on the steps within the protocol instead of waiting for uh, a train wreck. And so that uh, leads to a, a much better outcomes if we can head things off before, they, before the problem gets bigger. So principles of a HACCP system uh, starts with a, with a hazard analysis. We kind of look over the management practices that we're doing and try to figure out you know, where can things go awry along this process. Um, and once we figure out uh, where those things can go awry, we identify where are the points along this process where we can insert some monitoring. And ideally, it's nice if that monitoring is very um, objective. It's a it's a measurement. It's a key um, you know data point that is 
you know, harder to um, be subjective about, harder to misinterpret. Uh, but sometimes we don't have those and we do have to rely on uh, it's just subjective, you know, people skills of identifying points along the process where we can um, identify problem areas. We establish what the critical limits are. So what's our tolerance of, you know, when is a number bad or, you know, what, when do we need to keep, you know, when do we need to make a correction uh, when our, our critical control point limits are, are out of whack? And then um, what is the process we're going to use to monitor those critical control points? And so maybe that's a, um, a lab diagnostic, maybe that's a, a key measurement um, within, you know, somewhere on the dairy, but we, we identify which monitoring system we're going to use to, to monitor that critical control point. And then what are we going to do when things are out of whack? We figure out what's our tolerance, you know, when are things out of control, and what are we going to do about it when one of these measures um, does kind of raise that red flag to say something's out of control. We do want to verify the process along the way. We keep looking at these things and making sure that we're not missing areas or we make, that we don't need to make an improvement or a change in how we're analyzing the system. And a very critical piece here is a, a documentation step where we're recording our, our measures. And so that gives us basically an ability to go back and, and do that uh, verification or, or review process. So there's a lot of steps there. It sounds rather complicated, but um, we can apply this into some pretty um, basic day-to-day -day activities on the farm. And I just used calf feeding as an example. And so, you know, this here's someone who's, you know, the, the, the process for getting the calves fed in the morning is just we, we load up um, the wagon with our clean buckets and we we fill those buckets with their milk replacer. We drive over to the calf hutches and we go ahead and we um, fill their, their, their buckets. And we, afterwards, we, you know, we walk the hutches and look for potential health problems. And then later on, we go back and we grab those buckets and we maybe take a closer look at any of the calves that um, maybe we were alerted to earlier that might may have health problems. And then lastly, once we're done collecting all those empty buckets, we got to clean them. And so it's not uncommon at all um, for, you know, the, the, just the signal here is in the process of walking the calves, we saw disease, increased calf scours for this example. And I would argue that's really late in the system and the damage is done. And so can't there be things we can do ahead of time to maybe prevent this from happening in the first place? So go earlier in the process and try to see if there's other critical control points that can be identified. And so maybe we could put in steps to make sure that the items that the calves, the calves are being fed with are actually cleaned. Um, can we maybe make, put a step in place to make sure that calves are getting correct volume at a correct temperature and that the milk replacer are, is actually mixed correctly to, a, to a proper solids. And maybe when those signals get out of whack, um, we can make corrections before we end up with the that downstream health effect. So I thought it'd be fun uh, for these uh, sessions um, to maybe just use a few case examples to highlight where where HACCP may may have prevented this from the situation from arising. And so I'll just kind of present these as short little mini cases. These are real things um, that um, I uh, participated in over the years. Um, so I didn't I didn't make this this information up. Uh, so our, our first case here is a, you know, a farm visit in, on a pretty chilly February day, about a 500 cow dairy up in New England. They were having a lot of calf diarrhea, a lot of calves dying from that. Um, and they described it as typically kicking off around two weeks of age. And they said the problem has been going on for uh, three months, but definitely getting worse by the time we got there. So the owner uh, states that everything's been checked. So, but we can we can check everything again, and so some information shared. With, you know, calves were given four quarts of colostrum. They got that colostrum before they were six hours old. Dry cows were given a scours uh, prevention vaccine. Uh, the equipment seemed to be clean, um, and their winter feeding schedule was four quarts of colostrum twice a day of a 2620 milk replacer took a uh, bricks reading off of that, um, of a sample of that milk replacer and it measured 8%. And hutches um, really didn't have a lot of bedding in them for this time of year and calves did appear to be wet. And so you're, you know, you can th think to yourself, we're not, in a, we're not in a classroom environment so we can't discuss, but 
um, you know, think to yourself, there's several items here that stand out and you could debate where, you know, it's rarely one thing that really leads to a, to a health problem, a, a culmination or a combination of factors that really increase the risk of disease. Uh, the real standout here um, is that, that BRICS sample. Um, you know, 8% uh, total solids is remarkably low. Um, to be honest, it just looked like skim milk going into the buckets. So not, maybe I didn't need a, a meter to, to check that. But, um, you know, other areas add, adding to the risk of disease here as well. But um, this diet was not being mixed according to label directions. And these cows were not getting, getting the diet they needed. So we can put a, a monitoring step in place to periodically just do a check on the diet that's going out to these calves. And so if these calves are on a whole milk diet, you could take a BRICS reading, do a quick and dirty estimate of the total solids based on that BRICS reading, just a BRICS times two. Um, if you're feeding a milk replacer, um, things are approached a little bit differently. So from, for a milk replacer diet, um, unless the manufacturer just gives you what the BRICS ought to be, um, you can calculate that total solids based on the, the label. Just take the feeding directions and your total percent total solids of that product should be the pounds of powder that go into the mix divided by that same pounds of powder that goes into the mix plus the weight of the water in pounds. And you take that value, multiply it by hundred and that'll give you your, your target total solids. And then you, you really ought to come up with your own, like each milk replacer just due to manufacturer variation um, their, how these manufacturers, how these milk replacers are, are developed and manufactured. You can't just do a quick and dirty BRICS estimate. It doesn't give you a, an accurate enough number. So you can plot your own concentration curve by just mixing up that milk replacer at some known concentrations. And you can plot that or, or ask your, an advisor to help you with this. You know, plot this, I use Excel. Um, and these directions come from uh, Dr. Sheila McGirt, University of Wisconsin. And uh, once you plot your line, then you can get the slope of that line and the formula of the slope is what gives you the, the correction that you need to make on your BRICS reading to get an accurate total solids estimate. And so I, I included, this is a milk replacer example and the slope um, that I generated from some known concentrations. And then if we take a BRICS reading of, the, of a mixed sample of milk replacer and it says, let's say it says 12%, we can come up with what the true total, total solids is for that, for that um, milk replacer. So for this example, and there's a typo here, that shouldn't be a nine, that should be a zero, but I take my BRICS reading, I multiply it by 0 0.0105, and then I take that product and I add 0 0.003 to it. And so at the 12% BRICS reading actually is a 13% total solids. And this will, this will change depending on which milk replacer you're using. So again, unless your manufacturer is providing you with a, what they know the bricks should be, um, you have to come up with this, this, this concentration gradient to come up with how to convert your bricks to a total solids. All right, so our second case, uh, it's a little over a thousand cow dairy. Uh, I was asked for some help evaluating their calf protocols because they've had some more diarrhea and pneumonia in their calves recently. So age of scours for these calves is pretty early, usually about one to two days of age. Um, the pneumonia starts off um, maybe about a week or a little less than a week of age. Their protocol for colostrum um, is they give a gallon of colostrum and it, they make sure that it reads greater than 22% bricks. Um, and they feed that by a bottle and they tube feed whatever um, colostrum remains. Um, as the calf feeder, uh, they say sometimes uh, we get the calves or colostrum in less than an hour um, after they're born, but sometimes um, it can go pretty late, like if the calves are born overnight. Um, you know, it could be almost 12 hours after birth before they get their colostrum feeding. Um, there's a tube feeder in the utility room. It didn't look like it had much um, usage. It was pretty much covered in dust. And so I asked about um, how that tube feeder is used and uh, the feeders told me that they really, they really don't like using that tube feeder. They're afraid of it. They don't wanna drown any calves. Um, and they also mentioned that the calves really often don't even you know, drink all that, that whole gallon on their own. Um, so there's clearly there's an issue here of um, 
protocol deviation, um, these calves aren't getting what, what the farm protocol was for their first colostrum feeding. Um, did that lead to more uh, passive transfer issues? It, it, it certainly did. So uh, transfer of passive immunity, or we'll abbreviate that TPI. Um, we know that um, calves with successful TPI, uh, those calves are associated with lower risk of uh, getting sick or, or dying as, as calves. Um, and a successful TPI is achieved with good colostrum management. And there's lots of great information out there on how we manage colostrum. Um, and this is a, a, an example of where you can use a HACCP approach to identify areas before you have to manage the calf health issues. And so you can check all the calves or you can just periodically do a subsampling of, of groups of calves and check them for how well they absorb those, those antibodies from mom's colostrum. You start with at least 12. Uh, you could check more if, you, if you're more into um, statistics, but you know, 12 apparently healthy calves. Uh, we don't wanna be testing um, sick calves for this because those calves might be dehydrated and wouldn't give us an accurate blood result. So, you know, healthy looking calves about, you know, 24 hours of age up to about seven days of age. And ideally you want to take those blood samples about an hour and a half or so after their last feeding that ensures maximum hydration for your, for your results. And this is some new information, uh, Jason Lombard and Sandra Godden and, and several other calf experts uh, got together and uh, came up with a, a, a ranking of cluster management or passive transfer management um, results. Instead of our, our, you know, prior to this, we basically said you were doing good or you weren't doing good. You, we had a cut point and we want, you know, anybody who scored above the cut point there, they had good cluster management and anybody who scored below that, that cut point were, were doing not so good. And so this is a way we can maybe challenge ourselves to, even do better. If we're already doing pretty well with our cluster management, maybe we can strive for even better results. And so what, what, they, um, what they demonstrated here was using categories of cluster management from excellent, good, fair to poor, and how that correlated to serum IgG levels or how that would translate into serum total protein numbers or a BRICS reading. And what, purport, what proportion of those calves should, you know, what do we want as far as which, how much in each category we want them to score in. And so, yeah, the old system would catch, um, you know, we'd see that, you know, better, you know, 85% or so or better would, would score a serum protein of, of um, five and a half grams per deciliter or better, but um, we could challenge ourselves to do even better and, and really strive for those higher values to, to, you know, for optimal colostrum management. So uh, another case example here, this is a 800 cow dairy that um, reached out for some help. They're having a lot of calf pneumonia, um, both post weaning and pre weaning calves and pretty much all of them um, are affected. Um, they've had calf pneumonia problems in the past but things have really gotten worse and things were supposed to be getting better because they started a new uh, intranasal vaccine six months ago. So they thought they'd have less pneumonia, not more. And so they're pretty frustrated and they wanna, they wanna get to the bottom of this. So uh, we we'll review, you know, cluster management practices that all seemed um, okay. Um, this is kind of an old garage, maybe not ideal from a calf barn standpoint, but um, not, not that untypical in the Northeast. But you know, so an old garage didn't have uh, ventilation uh, much at all. Um, the milk replacer and starter grain diets appeared um, adequate. Um, There's plenty of vaccine in the old refrigerator in the utility room next to the garage. And we had a thermometer that recorded high lows. And so we, we placed that inside the refrigerator when we got there. And when we were all done with our visit, we went back and pulled that thermometer out and it gave us a reading of 36 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And so um, is this an example of the vaccine not working or, or, or what, what, can, what can be contributing to this? So um, maybe if we could pull up the first poll question, Casey. So I guess I'll wanna ask you all, um, what temperature range should your vaccine be stored at? Is 
there's not a whole lot of variation from one vaccine to the next. So what should it be? All right, okay. That's pretty good. I think we can close that poll, Casey. Thank you. So we've got you know a range here, anywhere from 30 up to 50 degrees, but the, the, the recommended label storage for most of our uh, commercial uh, cattle vaccines is 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you know, this, this refrigerator was operating um, just, just fine. It just, um, so it wasn't a malfunctioning refrigerator, but um, you'll be surprised how often they're not. How about the next poll question? Casey. So let me ask you guys out there managing calf vaccine programs. Do you know your vaccine refrigerator is staying at the correct temperature? And this is anonymous, so no worries. And yeah, I'm not, su I'm not surprised by this. Um, so we can close that poll and, you know, three quarters of uh, those who um, responded said they, they don't know um, if the refrigerator is doing that. And we can really challenge these old, typically household refrigeration units where we can be putting hot bags of colostrum in there. We can, you know, leave the door open unnecessarily. It's probably could be, you know, the coils really full of dust and cobwebs and things. So there's a lot of things we can do to really challenge um, these, these old units. And, and um, it's, we put a lot of expensive, important health um, instruments in there. So we wanna make sure we're taking care of it well. Um, we can in include some monitoring systems here as well. Um, I looked this up on Amazon just the other day for 10 bucks, uh, you can put a digital thermometer in your refrigerator that will record a high and a low for the day or whatever the period of time is between your checks. And so you can make sure that the, the, the refrigerator that's storing your vaccines is actually maintaining in a temperature range that you want it to be. You don't want it too warm. Those vaccines will erode and lose efficacy for sure. And you really don't want them getting too cold because uh, freezing damages vaccines, which will also decrease their efficacy and actually increase their um, reactivity. So we want to avoid vaccine reactions if we can. So also you know, monitor expiration dates. We don't want uh, expired vaccine. Um, those will definitely lose potency over time. Um, and really it's good to audit uh, usage and you know, vaccine programs. Um, it's one of those kind of regular used items. We have, a, there's a, you can quantify how much vaccine should you have used over a period of time because you just look at what's my vaccine protocol and how many calves have I raised over X period of time. And you ought to be able to, you know, within a reasonably close number, come up with how many doses did get used and compare that to how many doses should have got used. And uh, figuring out that we're only using half the doses or we're using two times the number of doses that we should have been um, is a more useful piece of information than waiting for down the road that we realize, wow, these calves never really got their vaccine or we, we overdid it, so. Um, and then, you know, we don't have a, a measurement to make here, but, you know, if you're the person giving the vaccines, you know, just take a look at what you're doing when you're drawing these products up and going out and administering to the animals, make sure that we're not mishandling the product. If, and if you're in charge of others whose job it is to give the vaccines, periodically, just watch the job getting done and just to make sure that it's happening the way you're expecting it to be, happen to be happening. So for that case example, um, is, all their intranasal vaccine was prominently displayed on the window ledge in the utility room. It never actually got into the refrigerator. And so chances are uh, the efficacy of that stuff was pretty poor. So just thought I'd uh, finish up the cases. <laughs> Um, how am I doing on time, Casey? You're doing okay. If you could uh, wrap up shortly, that would be great. Okay, sure. Okay, I, I, I get it. All right, so real quickly, <laughs> there's other things we can do um, that would um, identify some problem areas before they really got out of control. And so you can use bedding nesting scores um, to make sure that wintertime bedding is adequate to help um, calves stay warmer. Um, versus waiting for those calves to lose body weight and succumb to disease when their immune system suffers. So 
You can do a nesting scoring system also developed at the University of Wisconsin by Sheila McGurk uh, to quantify um, that the calf pens are getting adequately bedded. You can use respiratory scoring to uh, um, be alerted to subclinical or more subtle respiratory signs in your, in your calves um, instead of waiting for them um, to look um, a lot worse before we figured out they were sick. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this for time. Um, there are ultrasound um, reviews that um, you can do with your veterinarian to scan these, calf these calves' lungs to see, did we have some pneumonia going on? Do we have consolidation in our calf lungs um, that we may have missed? Maybe we didn't identify these calves um, earlier on to, to manage their, their health issues or if we're having a lot of lung consolidation, a lot of calf pneumonia, we should figure out a way to uh, manage that out of the system so we have less of it. And more new data. This was just a comparison of um, clinical respiratory scores and average daily gain. I did, they, they were able to demonstrate significantly improved uh, average daily gains in calves that had negative or normal calf respiratory scores versus calves that had significant respiratory disease. And lung ultrasound scores also demonstrated that calves that had no consolidation had better, significantly better average daily gains than calves that did have lung consolidation. And then average daily gain, uh, just a plug quick to, um, you know, this is a great indicator of the system working that nutritionally I'm providing for the calves in a way that is getting the growth that I expect. And there's not subclinical disease that's holding them back. If I can get a birth weight and I can get another weight when I get up to weaning time, I can quantify my average daily gains um, and be alerted to when I'm getting more calves falling short on my growth targets than um, than I wanted. So with that, just a couple of take home points. Um, so look over uh, the procedures and try to identify those critical control points. So we're not waiting for um, outbreaks to be our, our indication that there's a problem. Monitor the critical control steps um, in the process and that'll help you find those um, issues sooner. And get the whole team involved because you may not realize where there's opportunities um, in the process for monitoring uh, without getting the input from everybody involved in the, in the task. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up, Casey. Thank you very much, Rob. That was great. Lots to think about. Um, so just a reminder that we're going to take questions at the end. So if you're anything like me and you know you'll forget it, feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll get to it a little bit later. Or you can feel free to come on at the end after um, Mike and I present. So. With that, I will introduce our third speaker, Dr. Mike Steele. Dr. Steele is an associate professor in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. So thank you for joining us, Mike, and I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at your virtual day on calf management. It's a pleasure because this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. So I'm just going to go and share my desktop with everyone right now and go straight to my presentation. So. So the topic of my presentation today will be optimizing calf nutrition. So I think that this is a very important uh, aspect to, to spend a lot of attention to. So I want to show you why. So why early life nutrition is important, followed by some of the work that we've been doing in colostrum nutrition, followed by milk feeding, and then weaning strategies. So why early life nutrition? Why is this really critical? Well, I like to think of every single calf as a ball rolling down a hill. And depending on what kind of obstacles are in front of this ball as it's rolling down the hill will determine its end point. And the same thing's happening with calves. As soon as they're conceived, they're a ball rolling down a hill. And when you look at nutritional interventions, this can have a long-term impact. Now this concept we call early life programming, this has been well documented for decades in other species, but I think that where this research really took off was at Cornell University with the work of Mike Van Emberg, just showing this relationship between pre-weaning average daily gain and also lifetime production. So I think this was a big move forward, really showcasing that we need to spend a lot more time uh, with our calves. Which leads me to my first poll question. How many of the farmers out there are, are currently know their average daily gain? So if we could have a poll question now. So about half and half here. So I'm just gonna get out of sharing here and uh, just get rid of my video. Here we go. 
So we'll get into sharing again. Now, hopefully this will work a little bit better. So yeah, kudos to uh, the farmers out there that are actually measuring uh, average daily gain. That's really impressive that 50% of the farms would know that. In my experience, it's, it's less than 10% of farmers that actually know that value. So that's really incredible, uh, the group that's on this call right now. But just moving on uh, with my presentation here, hopefully the bandwidth, you know, in addition to growth, we have a lot of gut health issues and mortality and morbidity are improving, but still these numbers are, are still quite high with mortality and morbidity. So a lot more work to be done with immune status and the failure of passive transfer as well. And also antimicrobial use is, is still way too high on a lot of farms across the world and in, in here in the Northeast. And this is what you see too much of, just too much use of antimicrobials during this pre-weaning period when calves are getting diarrhea. So a lot more work needs to be done in this particular area. So this is my research program. I study colostrum management, plain of nutrition with milk and solid feed, also antimicrobials uh, and what they do to the calf and alternatives to antimicrobials and also the impact of the dam's nutrition on the actual calf. So what I'm going to be focusing on today for this very short presentation is just looking at some of the recent work we've been doing with colostrum management and also play attrition, pre-weaning as well as post-weaning. So just uh, starting with colostrum management here. Now, I think we all know the basics of quantity, quality, quickness, and cleanliness. You know, getting that gallon into the calf as soon as possible, making sure you're delivering up to 200 grams of IgG in those first meals, uh, getting it at the first, first hour of life and making sure that it's clean or also pasteurized. What I'm going to be talking about are some of the newer concepts. And the way, the first one I want to talk about is a recent paper published in the Journal of Dairy Science. It's a hot topics paper in this month, where the way that we monitor this colostrum quality and sort of, um, passive transfer, I think really needs to be scrutinized a little bit more. Now, it's great that a lot of farmers are using the bricks. There's obviously great value. Rob was showing with milk, but also colostrum. You want it over 22. That's great. But it's, we need to be very careful with a bricks refractometer. Now, when you look at maternal colostrum and you compare serum IgG and to serum total protein, there is a very clear relationship here. But if you compare colostrum replacer being fed these animals instead of maternal colostrum, which is, is commonly done, you're gonna get not a very reliable uh, reading from this BRICS. So you really shouldn't be using a BRICS refractometer if you're using colostrum replacer on your herd. And this is really frightening because there's a lot of you know, employees on farms uh, everywhere throughout the US that are actually being, you know, you know, monitored on this and, and bonuses are based on this. So really, it's not accurate using a BRICS refractometer if you're feeding colostrum placer. Take those values with a grain of salt if you are, okay? So lots more that we can do here to refine it. And we're just talking about immunoglobulins too and an estimate of immunoglobulins. What about all the other bioactives within colostrum? that we're currently not monitoring. So the, here's some of the proteins like hormones that are there in colostrum for a reason, insulin, IGF-1, epidermal growth factor. These are all hormones that the calf needs, but we don't really know the levels. And we don't know how they're absorbed and utilized by these animals, but I have a vision that hopefully someday we can know a lot more about these. Now, in addition to the proteins, there's unique fatty acids, but there's also unique carbohydrates within colostrum. So we call the colostrum uh, carbohydrates, although there is some lactose in colostrum, it's at a very low level, it's mainly oligosaccharides. And these oligosaccharides uh, act as prebiotics for the calf. So the cow is naturally producing these prebiotics for the calf, and we need to deliver it. And it's at really high levels, there's differences in parity but they're also at reasonably high levels in the second and third milking. So the cow is producing these very healthy components within the colostrum, also what we would determine a, define as the transition milk, which would be the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth milking that we should deliver. And this is just one, uh, one, evident, one component of colostrum and transition milk, just showing you uh, what the calf could potentially be missing if we just focus on passive transfer of immunoglobulins, which is typically done here, I've found most farms we're at the top here where we feed 
one or two meals of colostrum, and then there's a quick transition to a whole milk or a milk replacer. Now, I think it should be a transition, a gradual transition over the first days of life. And just to give you better examples and more rationale behind why that's very important, is an experiment that we did at the University of Alberta, where we fed calves the same colostrum in the first meal of life. And then we followed the second meal with just milk or milk and colostrum mixture, 50-50 or colostrum. And we fed these meals after that first meal of colostrum, which was the same for three days. And then we dissected these calves. And what we noted when we looked at their intestine is that we're actually depressing growth of intestinal villi by having this really abrupt transition from colostrum to milk. And the mixtures as well as full colostrum, you're seeing really great villi development. And why you want this villi development during this age is because we want to maximize the amount of energy being absorbed by this calf. During a time, typically, if you look at Journal of Dairy Science, they don't grow very much in this first week of life if we're not feeding them. Now, a byproduct of this experiment, not looking at gut physiology, but just looking at the immunoglobulins within blood, the first meal was the same in this experiment, but that second meal, which was a lot smaller compared to the first meal in this experiment, so we're, we're comparing a gallon, uh, almost a gallon in that first meal, then uh, something like half a gallon in that second meal here, the immunoglobulins are still rising. So to me, should definitely be feeding at, less, six, less, at least two meals of high quality colostrum uh, in that first 12 hours. And it looks like the gut is actually open uh, after 12 hours based on this response. Also, the persistency of immunoglobulins in the first days of life is actually greater if you feed more colostrum. So that, those are some of the new concepts in colostrum nutrition that we've been working on. There's still lots of work to do. Now, I'd like to share with everyone some of the new work that we're doing with milk feeding. Now, obviously, milk feeding, um, you know, if you have technologies, it's very you know, fortunate for farmers that, that have these technologies like this, this calf right here in this video, but uh, not a lot of farmers have this. But these technologies really promote early life intake of milk because you can feed multiple meals per day. In this setup here, they were feeding uh, almost actually three gallons of milk in the first week of life through multiple meals. This is an experiment using the same calf rail system where you can compare five liters versus 10 liters. And this is where I don't think that there's a lot to argue here uh, with respect to how much milk we should be feeding our calves. Calves in the first weeks of life do not eat starter. They don't eat significant amounts of starter. So if you want your calves to grow more in the first three weeks of life, you have to feed more milk. There's no way to argue against this. Um, they don't, I, I don't know of any calf contribute uh, consuming enough starter at week three to actually uh, gain at really high levels. So, so I think if you want average daily gain, their efficiency is greater in the first weeks of life and you need to feed more milk. I, I find it difficult to debate that. Although in this experiment, these cow and lower planes of milk actually caught up quite a bit because their starter intake was, was tremendous, but still week one and two, you're not getting that intake. Now that becomes a lot more important pushing intake, especially this month, okay? We should be increasing our milk feeding by at least 25%, but it really depends on the temperature as you can see here. Now look at this bottom one at 20 degrees, 55 kilogram calf, just to meet maintenance you need to feed half a kilogram of starter pay, of uh, milk replacer a day. But if you're at minus 30, the same calf, you have to double it. So this is a huge amount of milk that's really not being fed uh, across the Northeast. And especially here in Canada, we need to adjust our feeding levels. It's really important. Now that's enough about feeding levels of milk, something that we've invested a lot of time in and where most of our publications are right now is looking at the composition of milk replacer. And typically milk replacer and in all milk replacer formulation, but typically it's higher in lactose and lower in fat compared to whole milk. It's also higher in ash as well, but we won't talk about that today, but that's also very interesting. But typically you have higher lactose, lower fat. We were wondering what this actually does to the calf. Now, what we're concerned about with these high lactose levels and also the high ash is the osmols. So typically whole milk's around 300. Most milk replacers are well over 400. And in World Health Organization with infant formulas, it's actually illegal to sell 
some of these infant formulas that are over 400 uh, osmoles. So it makes you wonder what we're doing. Because hypertonic milk replacer increases gut permeability. And this is work uh, done by my new PhD student before she arrived to the lab. But we're just really showing you that this does happen. Also, higher lactose results in increased gastric emptying and lower glucose tolerance in the first week of life. And this is some recent work that was just accepted too. So this begs the question is, are these formulas contributing to gut health problems? And are they affecting the metabolism? Now, we just have short-term responses here, so we don't know the long-term consequences of this. But I think it's an important area for us to question and keep our eye on right now. Uh, so this is work that we'll be doing over the course of the next five years. I'd like to finish this presentation looking at weaning strategies. And we know a lot about weaning, obviously, especially related to ruminal development and all these dramatic changes that are happening during this time. But what I'd really like to focus on, what I think is the most important thing to consider with weaning, especially when you're feeding higher levels of milk, is the weaning age. And I think we just need to compare this calf to what actually happens in nature, which is probably close to a beef calf. We wean every single dairy calf early and abruptly. They're kind of behind the eight ball just based on our management strategies. They, in nature, they'd be weaned at six months. So we have to really, I think, um, you know, just pushing that weaning age had large impact. And just to show you this, this is one of the first weaning experiments that I conducted. These calves were fed a gallon, just over a gallon each meal, two meals a day. So as you can see, one group was weaned at six weeks of life. One week was uh, weaned, one group was weaned at eight weeks of life. And this was an abrupt one one step down, one week step down. The results really show that when you wean early, an overall growth, especially during this weaning. So post weaning, you're gonna be having uh, average daily gains of 150 grams at, at the six week group, but at eight week group, when they're weaned, you're gonna have average daily gain at 700. So just pushing the weaning two weeks later has a really large impact on average daily gain. This is uh, looking at the same experiment, six weeks on the left and eight weeks on the right. And this is just plotting overall metabolizable energy intake. And clearly these calves early in life that are weaned off higher milk levels just can't consume enough during the step down and post weaning to encourage this growth. But a calf at eight weeks can. So the take home message is definitely feed later in life if you're feeding, uh, definitely wean later in life if you're feeding more milk. We did a lot of work looking at weaning strategies as well and different step down strategies. And what we noted was when you have this abrupt step down strategy, you typically have higher fecal starch. So this just shows us that there's a lot of this starch bypassing the rumen and going to this lower gut. So the small and large intestine. And we were just wondering what that does. Now, we talked about milk replacer, but if you even look at starters, there's a huge range in composition in the marketplace. There's starters that range from 10 to 50% currently being sold in Canada and also the Northeast. My concern here is that if we get too much bypass starch due to maybe the composition of the starter, but also the weaning strategy in the weaning age, we could be inducing a hindgut acidosis. So it's good to look at ruminal acidosis and rumen health, but I think where a lot of these problems are happening, and if anyone has seen this in a post wean pen, this bubbly manure, it looks like there is a lot of hindgut acidosis occurring in these calves. So the question that we have and what we've been investigating is, should starter composition be tailored for milk feeding program? So we've been doing multiple experiments in this area, but I just wanted to introduce this concept. So I think what I want to see in the future is more research being done, pairing the milk feeding strategy with actual starter feeding strategy in the composition, because I think we might be missing some important details on farm. Another last thing that I'd like to include on is this big black box we have right after weaning. So most of the research is done in the first six months, in particular the first two months, and we really have this black box. And based on, you know, what I see most happening, especially post weaning is, I think we're overestimating how much forage this calf can consume. So we might think that this calf can consume over a pound of forage right at weaning, but it can't. I don't know if a calf that's ever consumed over a pound right at weaning. 
So I think we might be overestimating there's a large importance for concentrate during this time. So here's some dry TMRs that are becoming popular, at least here in Canada and Europe. I think they've made it to the Northeast a little bit. It's just a very convenient way of making a batch. Uh, you can store it in a commodity bay and feed out of it for a month. So you don't have to make a TMR every single day. But this is uh, on the left, a 70% concentrate, even though it looks like it's mainly straw, but 30% straw. I would say that that's too high for calf. That's right around weaning. More suitable would be an 85%, which is on the right here. So we did an experiment where we looked at milk feeding in the pre-weaning period. So a high-low milk, 10 versus 5 liters, as you can see. And then we wanted to see how they perform when you put them on these higher low uh, TMRs post-weaning. But pre-weaning, the classic response, feed more milk, less starter intake, as you can see here. Post-weaning, there was really no influence of the pre-weaning diet on the post-weaning. And the post-weaning uh, treatment started at 10 weeks. And we were comparing a high energy diet, which was 85% concentrate, and a lower energy diet, which is somewhat moderate in the industry, which would be 70% concentrate. And as you can see, that forage to concentrate ratio has a huge impact in overall energy intake, not just around this uh, immediate post weaning period, but throughout all the way up to 25 weeks. And this translates into more growth. Actually, post weaning, you can get a lot more growth out of animals without. Uh, gaining excessive condition. In particular, the two months post weaning, you can get up to uh, well over uh, three pounds of gain. So that's what we were characterizing in this experiment post weaning, but getting more growth signals, not just pre weaning, but also post weaning. Now, this goes, builds into the calf with growth, but it can also signal organ development. And what we found in this same experiment was that heifers offered this higher post weaning plane of nutrition had enhanced development of reproductive tract before puberty, higher chance of achieving puberty by 30 weeks of age, and a higher number of ovarian uh, antral follicles too. So just food for thought. I think that we focus a lot on pre-weeding, but there's a lot more that we can gain through post-weeding. So in conclusion, I think early life nutrition is really critical for lifetime performance. So we need to spend more time and actually measure average daily gains more on farms. Colostrum nutrition, I think that we're gonna be growing this area a lot, looking at transition programs more from colostrum to milk, as well as uh, looking at the other bioactives and what those bioactives are doing in colostrum. Milk feeding, obviously feeding more milk, but you, you definitely have to look at the composition of, of milk replacers if you are feeding it. And even milk for that matter, making sure that you're feeding something very constant. Weaning strategies, weaning later if you're feeding more milk is essential, but also having a very sound weaning strategy. And also looking at forage to concentrate ratios right after weaning. And also in the future, I think we're going to be looking at the composition of the diet a lot more and know a lot more about this topic. So with that, I'd really like to thank the Guelph Calf Research Team. But in particular, I'd really like to thank my lab group who does all this work. Uh, both some of the work coming from the University of Alberta when I was there, now at the University of Guelph. They work so hard and I really appreciate everything they do. And just to let everyone know, if there's any students out there listening, I'm always recruiting students. I'm really um, serious about recruitment. Here's my latest recruitment. Her name's Hazel Steele. She's six years old. She's interested in cows and coloring. So this is just to let everyone know how intense I am with recruiting. It doesn't matter what age you are. I'm going to try to get you into my lab if I see a great potential. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for this present, for uh, this opportunity to speak. And I apologize if there's problems with my interconnection. This is something I didn't expect, uh, but I'd be very happy to field any questions um, in, our, in our breakout session. So thanks again for this opportunity, Casey. Thank you, Mike. That was great. I really enjoy Hazel's recruitment process. <laughs> um, all right, so I have a quick presentation to give. It won't take too long, and then we will finish up with some um, panel-style question and answer with all of our speakers. So I'm going to start screen sharing. Lindsay, if you could let me know that the right screen is being shared, that would be great. All right, thank you. 
Okay, so just to sum up, um, we're going to finish with some research updates from a project that was funded by the Northern New York Ag Development Program, and the project was titled Determining the Pathogen Causing Neonatal Diarrhea and Associating it with Antibiotic Usage on Northern New York Dairy Farms. So my name is Casey Havikus. I am one of the Dairy Management Specialists on the North Country Regional Ag Team. And while I'm the one presenting the results of this research, I want to give a big thank you to my project team, which consisted of my colleague, Lindsay Perlito, as well as Dr. Rob Lynch with Cornell's Pro Dairy Program, and Dr. Sarah Morrison from the Minor Institute. So we know that neonatal diarrhea is an issue in the dairy industry. And according to the 2014 NOMS CAP Health Report, neonatal diarrhea is reported to be one of the two biggest challenges on US dairy farms, along with respiratory issues. It's also been determined to be the leading cause of pre-weaned heifer death. And then when we look more locally at the Northern New York level, Research from 2017 indicated that calves between the age of eight and 31 days were most commonly treated with antibiotics for diarrhea. We also know the basic causes of neonatal diarrhea. So it can be caused by a variety of different pathogens, including bacteria. So here you have your E. coli and your salmonella, as well as viruses. And the most typical ones that we hear about are coronavirus and rotavirus and then also your protozoal parasites, so cryptosporidium and coccidiosis. When we look at prevention and treatment of diarrhea, we can vaccinate cows as well as calves. And then also equally importantly is the cleanliness of the equipment that we're using when we're delivering calves, when we're feeding calves and how cows are housed and managed. And then also hydration becomes extremely important in terms of treatment of neonatal diarrhea. So electrolyte treatment is very, very important. And in most cases, or maybe even all cases, it's going to be beneficial for the calf. And then also water treat or water provision. So according to the FARM program, water access is now mandatory starting at three days of age for all calves along with starter access. So we really need to make sure that all of our calves are having access to water. And then lastly, antimicrobial therapy, we know can be beneficial in some cases of neonatal diarrhea. So that leads me to my first poll question. Lindsay, if you don't mind launching that, it is, do you use antibiotics to treat diarrhea calves on your farm? And you can answer never, very rarely, often, almost always, or always. So it looks like we have a pretty, uh, pretty good range between never and almost always with no one saying that they always treat calves. So that's really interesting to see the most common result was very rarely. So we'll stop sharing that. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so when it comes to antimicrobial therapy, we know that broad spectrum antibiotics have proven to be an effective treatment plan for calves affected by some bacterial diarrhea. And I highlight some bacterial diarrhea because we know that there are some, certain strains and pathogens that are not going to respond to it. But when we have our viral or protozoal agents, antibiotics is not an effective treatment plan. So it's not only going to be an unnecessary cost, it's going to increase that animal's risk of developing antibiotic resistance to that particular drug. And it can also increase the risk of public concerns. Over the past decade, we know that um, the public has raised concerns about antibiotic usage in agriculture. So if we can try to minimize that and do our part in terms of antimicrobial stewardship, I think that's a really important step moving forward. And then lastly, some research has shown that diarrhea calves treated with antibiotics produced over a thousand pounds less milk during their first lactation compared to diarrhea calves that were not treated with antibiotics. So that just goes to show that what we do to calves when they're babies can have a long-term impact on them when they start milking. So how can we guide antimicrobial therapy? So it's really difficult. Anyone that manages calves knows that there's less tolerance for a wait and see policy. We know that these calves are the babies. We don't wanna see them sick. We don't wanna see them at risk of potentially dying. So in many cases, we do what we can to try to avoid that. 
So according to the 2011 NOMS report, it indicated that over 87% of diarrhea calves are treated with antibiotics. And then once again, when we look at a more local level in, New in Northern New York, it was concluded that the most common use for antibiotics on farm was for diarrhea in calves. So some research that was done in 2019 hypothesized that bacteria would be the source of less than 30% of diarrhea calves. And in reality, those researchers found the true prevalence of bacteremia in these diarrhea calves was 15.3%. So we can see based on the results from this particular study that the presence of bacteria in these diarrhea calves was much lower than hypothesized. Yet when we look back at that 2011 data, over 87% of diarrhea calves are treated with antibiotics. So combined, all of these research findings suggest an opportunity to reduce antibiotic usage for diarrhea calves. And the reason I highlight opportunity here is because the aim of this research was not to discredit the efficacy of antibiotic treatment or to suggest that antibiotics should never be used for diarrhea calves, but rather to identify that opportunity to reduce antimicrobials and improve antimicrobial stewardship. So once again, we're not wanting to discredit any VCPR relationships and any treatment protocols that you have established with your vet. We just want to bring awareness and, um, and raise importance of this topic. So in this particular study, we enrolled Northern New York dairy farms that treat diarrhea calves with antibiotics. If farms were experiencing an outbreak, they were also invite, invited to submit samples, even if the calves were not treated. The fecal samples were collected from calves prior to antibiotic treatment to make sure that the antibiotics didn't have time to work once the sample was collected. Samples were sent to the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab for testing where they tested for two types of E. coli, salmonella, and then if salmonella was detected, the samples underwent further diagnostic testing to further determine the isolate. It also um, tested for coronavirus, rotavirus, and cryptosporidium. So just a basic summary, we had 10 farms total and we took a, or a, we had 90 calves total sampled from those farms. 18 of those samples were not treated with antibiotics and 72 of the samples were treated with antibiotics. And for the purpose of the results that I'm going to share, I'm only going to share the results from those 72 calves that were treated with antibiotics. Um, this is just a list of the drugs that were used. So um, pretty typical, the penicillins, we have the uh, cetiophores, set which are your Maxell and Exenel, your SMZ tablets, oxytetracycline, and so on and so forth. So um, the number of calves treated in the right-hand column, that does not mean that the calf was only treated with one drug. So in many cases, there was a combination of drugs that were used to treat the calves. And then on this slide, it's not, uh, these are not antibiotics, but I guess you could say they're supportive uh, drug therapies. So we had probiotics, banamines, and tripectate also used for these calves. So moving on to the results, this graph here is showing the prevalence of various pathogens causing scours. So I just want to point out that all of these calves were experiencing clinical signs of diarrhea and they were sampled because they were sick. So what you see here in red are positive cases and in blue, you see negative cases. So I'll walk you through each of them quickly here. So for coronavirus, ironically enough, it actually wasn't a problem for the herds and the calves that were sampled with um, coronavirus only affecting about 4% of the calves. Rotavirus on the other hand was a problem with about 70% of the calves sampled being positive for rotavirus. The both types of E. coli had less of a prevalence with 22% and 12.5% respectively. And salmonella had even less of a presence with only about 3% of those calves testing positive for salmonella. And as I mentioned, those salmonella um, cases were, went under further diagnostic testing and none of those samples came back positive for salmonella Dublin. And then lastly, we have about 46% of the calves being are testing positive for crypto. 
So did calves require antibiotic treatment? So before I explain these results, I just want to say that this is assuming that all E. coli and salmonella cases required antibiotic therapy. We know this is not necessarily the case, but for the purpose of how I summarize these results, we assumed that all cases of E. coli and salmonella would require antibiotic treatment. So within this group of farms, about 33% of the calves required antibiotic treatment. So about a third of those calves and about 67% of the time, they did not require antibiotic treatment. So this does highlight that there is an opportunity to reduce antibiotic usage for diarrhea calves. So when we look at hydration therapy, we can see that about 89% of the calves were offered water, which is great. Um, however, there is an 11%, 11 of the calves were not offered water, and that's a problem that needs to go down to zero, especially if you're having scouring calves. But as I mentioned earlier, providing water to calves is now mandatory according to the FARM program. So that number really needs to get down to zero and you need to be making sure that all calves have access to water. When we look at electrolytes, about two thirds of the calves were given electrolytes and about one third were not. So once again, pretty good number. I'm pretty pleased to see that two thirds were offered electrolytes. But again, I think that we can decrease that number. Um, of calves that were not getting electrolytes, especially because it's such a cheap and easy form of treatment and almost in all cases, it's going to help. So that leads me to my second poll question. Do you give electrolytes to your diarrhea calves? And you can answer that never, rarely, often, almost always, or always. So it looks like um, that's really good, actually. So we, we don't have anyone saying never or rarely, so I'm really pleased to see that. With a majority of participants saying that they almost always give calves electrolytes, and the next most common answer was always. So that's really great to see. So this chart here is showing the average age of infection by pathogen. So pretty typical for what we would expect to see Coronavirus is infecting cows around 14 days, rotavirus around 10 days, crypto around nine days, E. coli around 12 days, or E. coli intimate around 12 days, E. coli K99 around eight days, and salmonella around 14 days. And you can see the range off to the side there. So I just wanted to quickly point out to the number of pathogens infecting calves. So a lot of the time, um, the samples came back positive for more than one pathogen. So you can see here that a majority of the time they were only infected with one pathogen, but a little bit of, or quite a few cows were infected with two pathogens and then a couple were infected with three pathogens too. And the most common uh, combination of pathogens were rotavirus and crypto. So this chart here was put together by Dr. Lynch and I think it's a really great tool and um, tool that you can use to kind of assess what pathogen might be causing a problem and then what you should do about it. So you have your pathogen, the typical age range that you would expect that pathogen to be present, treatment, and then if hygiene and vaccination play a role. So it's really important to note here that in all cases, hygiene is very important. And then also in the treatment category, you'll see that in every single instance, supportive therapy is there. So that again is going to be your water provision and your electrolyte therapy. So um, again, I just wanna draw or highlight the importance that supportive therapy is extremely important and it's going to be beneficial in all of these cases. Whereas as you can see in the treatment column here, antibiotic treatment is, um, it could be helpful, but it could not be helpful in only the case of E. coli, K99 and salmonella um, in this chart here. So just to wrap it up on some next steps and concluding thoughts. So we have this data and that's great, but I think it's really important that we fo uh, focus our future research on validating a calf side diagnostic test so that you don't have to send a sample to the lab and wait for the results before you can make a decision on whether or not you treat that calf. So there are some calf side tests that are validated in other parts of the world. Um, to my knowledge, there's nothing available in New York State as of right now, but I think that's a really important area for us to focus our research efforts moving forward. 
And then also promoting awareness that antibiotic treatment should not always be the first line of defense, but rather hydration therapy. So I said it many times throughout this presentation, but once again, electrolyte therapy is always going to be beneficial to those calves. And I think that that should be the first thing that you go to when you're experiencing uh, diarrhea issues on the farm. And then lastly, understanding which pathogens are a problem on your farm can be very valuable for troubleshooting and implementing preventative measures. So if you wanna learn more about how to collect fecal samples, where you should submit them in the diagnostic process and costs, please feel free to reach out to anyone on the project team or your local herd veterinarian, and we will be able to assist you with that. So I just have one last poll question. Uh, does this information motivate you to make changes and or rethink antibiotic usage for diarrhea at calves? And you can answer yes, no, and maybe. And again, this is anonymous. You're not gonna hurt my feelings with however you respond. Okay, so quite a few people saying yes, um, a couple people saying maybe, and then a couple people saying no. So again, it's, it's really great to see. And um, I think it gives us some groundwork moving forward and some areas for us to focus more research on. Um, so with that, I would uh, like to thank our funding source once again, Northern New York Ag Development Program, as well as uh, Rob Lynch with ProDairy and Dr. Sarah Morrison with the Minor Institute and Lindsay for their help with this project. And um, I guess I'm the last speaker, so we can open it up to questions. And for this presentation, uh, Dr. Lynch and Lindsay and uh, Sarah, if you're on, you guys are more than welcome to assist me with the questions if there are any for this presentation. So oh, Casey, you do have a couple, so we'll just start just since you're already off mute, and we'll give Mike and Rob a second to, um, and Jennifer to get off mute. Um, so you had a couple questions, Casey. Margaret asked you um, if you know the breakdown of pathogen prevalence by farm. Yeah, I do. So, um, I mean, I, is there a, sp a specific um, number that you would want to know there, I guess? so. We had two, two farms that a majority of the samples or actually all of the samples they submitted, they all came back positive for rotavirus. Um, but then other than that, it was pretty um, not as heavy in one pathogen for farm. I would say those two farms were the only two that were like very heavy in one pathogen. And then um, Megan asked you, just curious, why you didn't use the data from the calves that did not receive antibiotics? Um, so the, yeah, I guess, so I guess for the purpose of this project, we were curious to see the antibiotic usage or the, the pathogens with calves that were treated. And then we just, we collected the samples from calves that weren't treated just to help the farm troubleshoot. But I guess that was a little bit um, out of the scope of the research project, but I think that did introduce some bias where we were selecting farms that only treated calves, or sorry, they, they were only enrolled if they treated their calves with antibiotics. So I understand that that does introduce some bias and we would have to interpret the results um, carefully in that sense. But it, I think going forward, it would be really interesting. And actually Dr. Lynch and I talked about this. Um, I think it'd be really hard to do. I don't think we'd get many farms to volunteer, but to see a farm that does treat calves with antibiotics and then treat half the calves and then not treat half the calves and see what those responses would be like. But again, I think it'd be really hard for um, farms to volunteer for that type of study. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go to the top and go with our first questions and then we'll give people a chance to come off mute. So this is probably a question um, for Jennifer, but Rob, coming from the health side of things too, you can probably jump in. Um, so years ago when group housing was increasing on farms, it was advised that if the farms were struggling with highly transmissible diseases, specifically salmonella Dublin, um, they should not use group housing. Is this still a valid point and what might those farms options be? That's a great question. So yeah, I can kick off, but I would also love if um, Rob could weigh in. So that's definitely still a valid point. So as I said before, we need more research on the implications of social housing on calf health. There hasn't been enough studies to do done to date to answer some of these questions really well, but we have no reason to believe that calf health will necessarily improve in group housing unless you also improve some of these other management factors that are needed to promote group health. So, so calf 
social housing alone isn't going to improve those problems. And I would definitely recommend that if a farm knows they have an issue like that, especially if they've identified the pathogen, they, they need to focus on fixing that problem before moving to pair or group housing. At the same time, I would say there is a lot of momentum behind pair group housing. It is by no means mandatory in the US or Canada at this point, but we have a lot of reason to believe that there's going to be increasing pressure to move in that direction. So as proactive as you can be to identify those kinds of issues, that's to your benefit. And so I know I really breeze through that cap health section, but we do try to address some of these in our starter guide series to try to pinpoint what are the things that you could tighten up in terms of the management. And this is where it'd be great if Rob could weigh in too. But yes, it, it's a really good idea to get that under control because the problem's likely to only become worse if you intermingle cabs. Yeah, it's really, really tricky if you get like a highly pathogenic, highly transmissible disease in a group of animals. How do you how do you keep it from bouncing around to everybody else? So, and even isolating the clinically ill, um, you're, you're still going to miss a bunch of subclinicals that it's just hard to maintain a hygienic environment when that's going on. So I think that recommendation of um, breaking them up when, when something like that rears its head, is it's just, it's just an effort to control, just, just keep minimize how much spread there is. And I think to add on to that, what um, Dr. Rob was emphasizing is when you know you have a problem like that, it is sort of a emergency situation where quarantine is warranted. Like when we've been talking about social distancing and farm contacts and in human contacts, it doesn't mean that we need to isolate for the rest of our lives. When you're under an emergency situation, you know you have a problem. Yes, you wanna use the strategies that are available to you to try to contain that. And that would not be a good time to move to group housing. So we have some, rough guidelines for benchmarks you want to try to hit first. So what is the mortality rate on your farm? What is the morbidity rate? And especially if you know the cause, that's a jump start to try to pinpoint how to get those numbers down. So I would not recommend a farm transition to pair group housing if they know that they have some challenges like that. Yeah, and um, it brings up an excellent point of um, part of the spirit of Casey's project was trying to generate some more interest in some calf diagnostics like we often just assume we know what's doing it and we we kind of roll into our treatment regiments and we often don't know the causative organism when we're dealing with the disease in the calves and so you know just extra push for you know which know what enemy you're fighting and that that includes a diagnostic effort um jennifer another question for you um is there a main message or point that you share with industry members that remain skeptical about social housing? Yeah, so my take home message is, we know that dairy cattle are a social species. It's really important to recognize that there are well-established documented detriments to raising cow calves individually. So there was a reason the industry pushed in that direction, but if it depends on the farm, right? Like if your farm isn't in an emergency situation, if your management is really good, you have good health outcomes, why not? try it out because as I said, we have enough information out there to, to make these predictions. If I were to bet money, I would say there is gonna be increasing pressure worldwide to move towards parent group housing. It's not mandated in North America, but there are regions of Europe where it's required by law. Elsewhere, it's coming through the supply chain. And I think if we wanna be forward thinking and proactive and really promote good calf welfare and good cow welfare to show that we're really committed as an industry to maintaining a high bar, it's good to start thinking about it now. And so the take home message is there are so many documented benefits now of parent group housing. It's not without challenges, but a lot of these challenges are surmountable. So we're still doing a lot of research to try to come up with solutions, but just look at all the success stories that are out there. So not every farm is ready today, but a lot of farms are, and there are ways that we can help people get to that stage. And um, that same person also asked, if there was any data looking at the effects of the number of meals in group housing. So not that I'm aware of in terms of the number of meals, it's mostly been phrased in terms of meal duration or the total uh, milk allowance. And I think that that is a good unanswered question that, that's out there because actually I get a lot of questions about auto feeder systems where in theory the calves are fed ad libitum daily milk allowances, but they're still seeing cross sucking. And so I speculate it could be because oftentimes you only have one nipple for the whole pen. So other calves might be hungry or stimulated to show suckling behavior and they're not able to find an appropriate outlet 
or the meal criterion could be too small. And so they're not getting enough time on the nipple to drink. But again, we need more data to help establish that. And if we look at natural behavior where calves would be suckling from the dam multiple times per day for about seven to 10 minutes per time, the more we can try to mimic that, the more likely we'll be successful at minimizing cross sucking because we don't see that in these extensive cow-calf systems. And then a couple questions for you, Mike. Um, this one is from a farmer in Nova Scotia that says that they have tried to feed a forced feeding during times of very cold weather, um, but they've never had any success. Um, I find a calf may drink one meal, but then miss another meal because they weren't hungry. Any suggestions that we can try to make this work? Yes, the belief, uh, this question was about a farm that was uh, attempting to feed even four times a day. So they're currently feeding three times a day because I've been going back and forth with the, the farmer. Uh, three years per feeding, three times a day, through the span of four, 11, 30, and six. So if they're not taking that final meal, I'm assuming that you'd be fit later on at night. I think you can get away with three meals. Already what you're feeding is probably in the top, top percentile there, and at least in the top 20% when it comes to volumes already. If you're concerned that they're still not getting enough energy, you might want to increase the meal size to 3.5 liters, just to get another 1.5 liters of, of total meal into these animals. It's going to be challenging to get them to consume that milk though late at night where I think that you were attempting to uh, put the fourth meal. So I think another way to approach this already, what you're doing is great, is just to increase the meal size a little bit more. Research from our lab has shown that you can go up to four liters per meal with no problem with respect to insulin sensitivity or even gut health. So, so I, that would be my recommendation for that farmer. And what are your thoughts on the use of a dry post weeding diet using corn and a mineral as the concentrate portion rather than a pellet? Yeah, that's becoming a lot more popular to create your own post weeding diet and not rely on a grower. Uh, my concern there, if it's just the forage, really depends on the forage. My concern with a whole corn and a mineral is that you might be lacking some protein. You know, granted, the corn will produce a lot of microbial protein. But my concern with that approach would be the lack of protein going into that because they still need significant amounts of protein that are not just coming from microbial protein, especially during weaning, during a time when the rumen's not well developed and that microbial protein synthesis is not optimized. Great question. And just a reminder, if anyone does want to jump off mute, um, you are welcome to. We will just give them a minute to try that if they wanted to ask a question on audio. If not, we've got another question in the chat box. Yep. I, yeah, I saw one from Ben. Is it okay if I answer it? Yeah, do you just read it aloud first? Yeah, so <laughs> Dr. Steele, some studies have shown decreased NDF in organic matter digestibility during the post weaning period for calves previously fed a high plane of milk nutrition. Do you have any ideas how this could be mitigated? Uh, I think a lot of this work is coming from calves that are fed elevated planes of milk uh, or, um, or in regular levels, but they're weaned early in life. And also when you look at NDF as a composition or what is it bringing to the diet, there's not, you know, it's at a very low level. We're feeding forage less than 10% at this time. Granted there's NDF in the concentrate, but it's, we're getting the energy from rapidly fermentable carbohydrates at this age of life. So although the NDF will be decreasing, it's probably something to do with ruminal development or microbial uh, composition of the rumen uh, or also age. But I think when you add up all of the energy in the diet and what can come out of NDF at that age, it's very small. So I don't think it's that relevant. And if you think it's relevant, I would just wean animals later in life. So Rob, I have one that was privately messaged um, to me. Um, so Rob, what advice would you have for farms that currently don't have a strong SOP program to help them get them implemented slash prioritized, especially farms that struggle with labor and not having enough time? Yeah, I, I mean, it always starts with the first step, right? Just pick, pick one, pick one procedure, maybe the one that's giving you the most headache at the, at the time and just work on that one. And once you get that rolling um, and realize that 
you know, there's there's some benefit had there, then it just makes you know tackling the next one that much easier. So just pick pick one process and work on that protocol. Don't it's overwhelming to try to think of everything. Yeah, definitely. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so uh, last chance, we're getting up to 205. So I think we should try to wrap up. But if anyone has any last minute questions they want to throw in the chat box, or if they're brave and want to unmute themselves, please feel free. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to copy and paste the link to the survey in the chat box again. Um, as a reminder, uh, it's not going to take long. Please, if you can take a few minutes to fill it out, it would be very helpful to Lindsay and I as we move forward with program development. Um, so I'm not... I, I did receive a private message, actually. Somebody messaged and asked that they're really interested in payer housing, but they only have about one or two heifer caps per month. So what are the possibilities for them? And this is a great question because it is quite common that there's definitely a limitation when you have fewer calves available because that means your age range within pairs is going to be larger. And so for a smaller farm like that, we definitely would not recommend large groups because the experts uh, consensus so far is you want to keep that age range between the older and younger calf in a pair to two weeks, ideally one week. So we've had a lot of conversations about creative strategies. So one would be to keep male calves if you can for a little bit longer so that they can be companions to each other. Another is some do seasonal calving. So they'll try to batch their calves up or use some kind of synchronized AI protocol. Um, but this is still kind of an unanswered question. What if it becomes mandated like it is in Europe? What's the recourse for smaller farms? And so I think the, the question is still out there and we have to think creatively, but yes, we wanna keep those age ranges to a minimum. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for sharing that, um, Dr. Vanos. Um, okay, so we will wrap it up. Uh, we just wanna thank our generous sponsors once again. This program would not have been made available to you guys at no cost without their support. So we are very appreciative of them. Um, we would also like to thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a great four days. We hope that you enjoyed it. And we would like to give a big thank you to our great speakers that we had today. Um, Dr. Lynch, Dr. Vanoss, and Dr. Steele, your presentations were wonderful, very informative, and um, we are very appreciative to have you come on and uh, spend the afternoon with us. So thank you again.